And that's part of where the beauty can come in mm. is it's only on the other side, mm. right? That you can look back and see how you grew and how you changed and how you learned mm. through something like that. I feel like it's an interesting topic as well because it, it's somewhat misunderstood. It can be misunderstood. People don't need change management training. They need resilience. They need mm. skills to help them to move through this. And that just kept coming up over and over again. You have a, a similar sort of challenge where you're you're looking for ways to going back to like engaging leaders, mm. right? Because you can't always just pay them more or promote them. What are things you're trying to do to solve that? One of the things that I'm really trying to work on is to connect what we're doing and what we could do very, very clearly and directly mm. to their greatest pain points and, and mm. what they're struggling with. Mm. And for me personally, I want to see myself just be brave and courageous to, you know, speak up and say something if, mm. you know, if they're asking for something and I don't think it's going to work, mm. you know, just to be willing to, mm. to say that. And, you know, if people can make the decisions that mm. they want, but mm. you know, that's, that's who I want to be as I lead through yeah, this. Yeah, I love that. Do you think that the way change has been traditionally taught and developed as a skill is outdated? Ooh. This wasn't a prepared question. No, it's not, <laughs> but it's interesting. I think it's terribly important to insist on individual values. Learning culture podcast. Initiative, creation, all these things which we value now possible to make organizations on a larger scale than was ever possible before. Learning Culture Podcast. Teach people to analyze the kind of things that are said to them. Anna, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, I'm excited for this conversation. So you literally have just left the convention center, came to join us here in this podcast studio. Which is uh, lovely, by the way. Right? <laughs> I think we got so lucky. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and you would heard Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Uh, and you took a whole bunch of notes about that. And we were just sort of talking off air a little bit about it. And um, I think that's a great place to start because you said to me one of the things that he shared that you didn't know this about him as well. Mm -hmm. So right, those that have read his book, Green Lights, will know more about this. Those who just know him as an actor, there's like a whole other world to, to him. And the stuff that he talks about now is is really stuff that we need mm -hmm. these days right like the the uncertainty and the turmoil and the chaos that everyone is feeling and he has a message around how to approach that um and how to deal with that what was like one of your biggest takeaways and you've, you've just walked out of this and it's, it's yeah I mean, I, I literally think I wrote down almost every word, every word he said during that, I think it was maybe 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, there was one, one comment that he made that I just loved, which was that, uh, and maybe this is in the book, I haven't read it yet, so I'll have to go read it afterwards. Yeah. But he said, some people want the AC on at the gym so that they don't sweat, but he wears his beanie in July so that he will. Mm, mm. So he's embracing the discomforts. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and just the fact that life comes with discomfort mm. and it's almost guaranteed mm. that we're going to face challenges and trials mm. and things that don't go the way that we want them to. Mm. And it's not a matter of if, but when yeah. are we going to face that? And yeah. so he just talked a lot about, you know, having a mindset that is, you know, what will I do and how will I respond when I face those mm. kinds of situations mm. uh, in order to persevere and to learn through them, which is mm. incredibly relevant for, you know, mm. the talent development conference. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. So let's let's talk about that. First, let's talk about why this is important because another aspect of it that, that comes with this change and uncertainty and all that is the, the I guess, um, like tendency that people have to, uh, to kind of, feel like something's been done to them, right? To feel like the victim, right? And to um, to not have that uh, that embracing kind of mentality. So can you speak a little bit to that? Like what, what have you seen around that? What, why is that so hard for people? Yeah, it's very relevant for what my organization is going through right now. We have been through a tremendous amount of change in a very short period of time. Mm. So um, I work for a company called Software AG and we were um, purchased by a private equity firm, delisted, and then it was announced in the uh, 
winter of last year that we were selling one of our largest products, which is about half of our workforce. Massive change. Massive change, mm. yeah. So we're, you know, preparing for that transition to finally take place. And, you know, people on both sides, those who are going and those who are staying, I just are faced with a tremendous amount of uncertainty of, of not knowing what it will be like on the other side. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of neuroscience and understanding how we react within our brain yeah, to on a rea- biological level, yeah exactly yeah. and yeah. uh if you're familiar with the scarf model da- no, yeah. david rock uh from the neuro leadership institute uh, so it's it's an acronym that stands for things that get triggered that put us into a threat state okay. but they can also put us into a state where we will actually move towards so it's okay. status yeah. certainty autonomy relatedness and fairness okay and so I think in this season of, um, of turmoil and uncertainty and not knowing what's next, I mean, we could probably spend the entire time talking about those five items yeah. and everything that gets triggered that, that causes us to want to run away mm. when we face something like that, it, you know, that fight or flight response instead mm. of really engaging in mm. a moment and leaning into it. And Matthew McConaughey talked about that this morning too, that, you know, it's really easy to, when we're faced with that, to, like you said, see ourselves as a victim of the circumstance yeah. and you know this this isn't what i wanted i don't know i don't know how to respond or react and move through this uh, and that's part of where the beauty can come in mm. is you know once you're on the other it's only on the other side mm. right that you can look back and see how you grew and how you changed and how you learned mm. through something like that but mm. You know, with, with everything that we're going through, we're also trying to give people space to process that mm. and to look at, you know, the losses that they are perceiving. So losses of colleagues that they uh, that they love working mm. with, losses mm. of maybe opportunity going to, you know, a larger organization or going to a smaller organization, mm. risk of losing your job. Yeah. And these are all losses, but they also all present opportunities. Mm. So there's things that we can learn through them. There's Mm. ways that we can grow and we don't get to know that on this side, right? You can only, you can only really truly see it when you're on the other side of it. But yeah. 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 So we went through a very similar situation last year as a business and and had people that that had to leave and then others have joined and and so a lot, a lot of change. And one of the things that I learned from that, you mentioned all the losses, that there is there is grieving yeah. that has to happen, right? And it's so easy in, to get caught up in the in the pace of business and to not to give that time. Is that like have, have you kind of thought about that as well and explicitly? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think one of the most challenging things is that when you're going through something like that, your workload also increases. Yeah. If you're reducing, then you have teams that are doing more with less. Mm -hmm. And then you're asking Mm -hmm. them to just kind of get on board and keep working. Mm -hmm. And yet they are overburdened with work and they're overburdened with the, you know, emotional transition, the grief. And and, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's really challenging, but important to help people carve out that space. Mm -hmm. And so we've been offering these sessions that were, they're three hours long, which is a lot of time to take away when you're, yeah busy and when you're overburdened and so it really requires you know one people have to understand and see how that's going to benefit them Mm. in their work so yes i'm taking away a little bit of time either maybe from my personal time Mm. or maybe it means that i'll have to work a little bit harder but will that then provide dividends and pay out Mm. more in the long run where you know I can bring more energy tomorrow mm. <laughs> because I gave myself the time and the space mm. to process and to think through, mm. but it's hard. Yeah. So these three-hour sessions. Tell me more about that. Like, what are they, what are they? How do they play a role? When what do they look like? Yeah. So they're all about the concept of resilience and trying to equip people with specific tools that they can use to change mindsets, to change the way that they're. Um, holding something so we have you know limiting beliefs things that we believe to be true that Mm -hmm. you know really actually may be holding us back from from growing or from making a decision Mm -hmm. Uh, and and part of that too is about giving people that sense of control back so I said the scarf model earlier right so one of those is certainty yeah 
and the other is autonomy. And so when we feel like we've lost control, which is very common when you're experiencing mm -hmm. change, especially when it's a change that's happening to you that yeah. you didn't ask for and you yeah. didn't choose. Yeah. So you can have that victim mentality yeah. um, or you can take back the autonomy and control of what choices do I have and what decisions can I make? Mm. So even making the choice to, to stay at an organization through a transition like that, that is a choice. Um, now, not everybody feels like they can make that choice for mm. a lot of reasons, mm. but the more that you can kind of regain that control over your circumstances mm. and mm. at least feeling like you have some influence over, you know, whether you stay or go or how you move through that, yeah. give people their power back in a way. Yeah. Wow. There's so many things I want to unpack <laughs> about this. This is, this is yeah. great. So, um, I was also, I, I would, curious what your your thoughts on this i'm going to come back to some of the specifics of, of the, those sessions because it's it sounds like you, you you created those sessions in response as like an initiative to respond to this change and help people go go through them okay yeah yeah and we partnered with an external vendor who we've she actually used to work with our company and left and started her own business and so uh, we've brought her back because she has a a familiarity with oh, the organization awesome. which is really nice but now she's on the outside so she can spend time really crafting thoughtful yes yeah very thought-provoking and reflective sessions yeah. so. okay so i want to come back to that but I, I was sort of i guess reflecting the other day on change and the i was just listening to something on my phone and um it was on youtube or something and i, I don't know what happened but like it, the song stopped right and i was i was fascinated by that moment of when you're like in a song and you swept way by and you're like you're you're just feeling it right yeah and then suddenly something you know the thing yanks and it just abruptly stops right and you're zooming into that moment it's a very disorientating moment you're just like you know that you're like anticipating the next part of the song and then it gets taken away from you right that is like a little microcosm of what change is like right like you you <laughs> I can relate to that. Right? Like, you know, and, and uh, so there was, there was so much like, well, yeah, I mean, so the disorientation was one of the first things. I was like, that, that's a, re a very real reaction to change. Like, you don't even know how to process it or like how to even make sense of it yet. You, you're just disorientated. You need like that, like kind of like, when, you know, we was, you arrived here, like we had some time to just kind of like settle and stuff. You need that like settle yeah. in, in time, right? Um, and sometimes it happens more than once. Yeah. And that's a reality that is become I mean, you've heard the Bani and VUCA description yeah. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we're heading into this time where change is constant. Mm. Actually, we've been there, but mm. I think people are recognizing it more. And yeah. so, you know, it's not this pretty linear, you know, the Kubler-Ross change curve exactly. where you go through grief and then it goes back down and then you're fine. It's more like a roller coaster yeah. and it happens multiple times and yeah. you have new realizations of what the change means. Yeah. And then you head back into grief again. Yeah. And Only yeah. for another thing to change. Right. And yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. I, that's also something that I've been thinking a lot about that there's, do you think that the way change has been traditionally taught and developed as a skill, um, the, the ability to, to navigate through change um, is outdated? Ooh. This wasn't a prepared question. No, it's not, <laughs> but it's interesting. And uh, I did, I completed a master's program in organizational leadership and learning. Yeah. And we, I took a, a semester on change leadership, not change management, because those are two different mm -hmm, things, mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't realize. And yep. so, yeah, we studied, we studied a lot of traditional change models and then also looked at some, uh, I guess some, maybe some more recent articles and some more recent research. So I think there's some things out there, not necessarily maybe in the form of a model, mm. so. but yeah. So for example, there was one that I remember where it just represented that, you know, senior leadership in an organization goes through change earlier than mm. middle management, mm. which is earlier than the rest of the organization. And mm. so by the time, you know, your frontline employee is experiencing and processing through the change, 
the leader is already completely through it and yeah. has the whole picture yeah. and understands it and is excited and is thrilled. Yeah. And so there's this massive disconnect between, you know, the senior wow. leadership of a company and the average employee yeah. because they're just starting the journey and they don't have the full picture. And it takes time to, mm. to translate that picture in your mind into the minds of, of people. So I definitely think that there's too much nuance to probably build a model that completely I captures agree. it. I agree. Yeah. Um, so. That, which is it takes me back to these sessions. By the way, like I, that's actually I feel very seen because I, you know having gone through this as a leader of my company, that's a very real experience that I just had, and it was that part of I, I. It took me a while to appreciate that that people were needed longer, or that I would just I had started earlier, basically. Um, and I think I learned that the I had to just communicate as way more than I thought. Oh yeah. Right, like that was over communicate. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. the biggest thing. And I was like, there were days where I'd be like, I don't really have much new to say. Like, why are we doing a, a, an all hands? And sometimes it was just about showing up in the all hands. And I didn't actually have anything new to say, but you know, it actually, people, other people did. You yeah. know, and like that was actually where one of our, our teammates talked about the grief, and he actually gave words to that. I kind of learned that that from him, and gave words to what everyone was feeling. And like that, I never, you know, if if I didn't if I didn't like show up at that meeting and then yeah. that conversation there would have happened. Is and you, that, yeah, yeah, you have to have a lot of patience as a leader. So I, I have a lot of empathy for you going yeah. through that situation because you can feel, and I'm seeing this happen at our organization right now that our leadership feels like they have communicated everything. Mm. They feel like they've given the organization and the people all of the answers that they have and yet it's still not enough for people mm. or maybe they missed it mm. uh, maybe they missed that conversation and so they're having to repeat themselves over and over again and that mm. can be really frustrating mm. yeah and yeah. you know you feel like i've said this we've been through this why aren't you all understanding yeah. why aren't you getting why aren't you getting it mm. so it takes a lot of patience yeah to just be willing to do that yeah yeah because you also have to get to everyone you can't leave any person and like touched i guess in terms of getting them to you know to being with them basically on the journey like you you can't you can't afford that in the organization right? yeah and people you know communicate differently so you might have said it one way but someone needed to hear it yeah. a different way for it to make sense and yeah. to click so yeah over communicating and saying things multiple different ways yeah yeah okay so let's go back to these these um three hour sessions that you did did you have a name for them better than just three hour sessions <laughs> So it's called fortifying your mind through transition. Oh, okay. That's yes. awesome. And so what were people signing up for? Like, what did they, how did they perceive it? So we, it's actually a pretty unique model that we took for this, which I have to give full credit to um, Shabina Butt, who is our facilitator. Uh, her company is playing with boundaries. So this was her her brainchild. So we gave her the requirements. We did the, the interviews with our leaders and identified leaders and employees, just understanding what they were going through, what some of the greatest and deepest needs were right now to mm -hmm. help people move through the transition. And she selected four different skill sets and associated each of them with a character. Mm -hmm. So there, the first one was called the mythologist. And that was the one that was all about changing the way that you look at losses and reframing them as mm. um, opportunities. Mm. And so each character, so you know, a learner will go to the page and they'll see these four characters with a character card that describes their strengths and the skills or, you know, it's almost like you're playing a, a game and yeah. you get to see the, the strengths of each character and yeah. you choose the one that you want to play. Yeah. And so you could go to all four of them and choose to gain skills from each of the four characters and build uh, like a practitioner's toolkit. And so these are yeah. skills that you can use both for yourself to help you process through and move through transition, but you can also, you know, use them with other people. And that's part of the vision for it. And some of the outcomes, comments that people were sharing at the end mm. legitimately made me want to cry. It was yeah. beautiful what people were sharing that, you know, they said, I thought I came for myself, but now I want to go take this to the rest mm. of my team and, wow. and share with them. You know, some people made comments uh, like, I used to think that you know, this change was all negative and now I see opportunities or I used to mm. think I had to stay and now I know that I can go. Yeah. Other people thought I used to think that I had to go and mm. now I believe I can stay and mm. make an impact. Mm. So that's amazing. Yeah. 
And so, so much of this is happening through conversations, right? You mentioned sto stories, like limiting belief stories and that this is a big part of our work as well. We believe that stories are these containers of meaning and it's one of the best ways to, to understand people better, right? And then the benefit of l learning about different perspectives and having, mm. you know, more of those, the bet. So uh, it, it sounds like, I'm, I'm maybe reading into this, but it sounds like that was a key element of these programs. It was, was it like a cohort, um, you know, like you, you, the individual chooses one of these things, but then how is, what does the interaction look like, I guess, after that? So we've only had the first one. Actually, the second one happens tomorrow. Oh, so oh, awesome. I'll have to get back all to right. you so and let you know. Like this is all very new. We're in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's definitely a, a model that we like to take in our learning experiences to have them be very immersive and exercise based. Mm. So these specific sessions are very reflection based, okay. which was really i mean again we were talking about it earlier that people don't take the time because yeah. they're so busy yeah. to allow themselves to process yeah. through and it's and that's a, yeah gift yeah. to be able to give, uh, give people that time to yeah. do the sessions yeah. so so that was really the first session this one about you know reframing the way that you look at at losses it was all about giving people the time for deep reflection mm. so you know as they so to answer your question, they could go to just one. Um, so it could, you could be with the same people in that one session that maybe a same group goes to oh, all so four these are, of them. These are like four different sessions you could join. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Okay. So and so again, the first one was you know really heavily reflection based, which is not traditional. I mean, it's really not training I know. Um, in the traditional sense of which of is the word. Yeah, yeah yeah. But but it's more effective, right? Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, there is an element of knowledge transfer, I guess, if that's what you're thinking of when yeah. you think of training. But, you know, we, and maybe this could be a segue to something else um, that we're working on, which is developing our leaders to help mm. people lead through change. So this mm. program is really aimed at anyone in the organization. Certainly leaders can and could and did mm. attend, mm. but mm. it's really geared more towards just any employee mm. trying to process and move through it. But we're trying to do something similar with our leaders, which is not to just put them in a training session and teach them a change management model and, yeah. and try and yeah. teach them a framework that they can follow, but is really just to give them more time to look at their situation and where is the gap between where I am and where I want to be and mm. and using that time not to teach them something that then they have to go back and find time for yeah. which they don't yeah, exactly. <laughs> but to give them the time in the sessions to really do the work exactly and it's hard because then you have to get them to take time away from the work yeah so it's convincing people that this is valuable time mm. spent mm. Uh, you know it's not just a, it's not just another training this is yeah. an opportunity for you to do work that you haven't had the time for because mm. you're so busy like, mm. we know you're busy mm. that's why we've designed it this way yeah yeah i want to go back to that point you just said about um like it's not training in the traditional sense and, and there's also that perception you have to get across to people of like okay i know this is what you think training is but what you're about to do is not that and this is actually going to help you like you said do the work I love is like a, it's like a Byron Katie reference there yeah right <laughs> um because that and the, the work what is what do we mean by that right actually let me ask you that what do you mean when you say do the work well I guess I wasn't thinking of it in the Byron Katie sense um which is you know doing the work of well actually I guess it the kind session kind of was, kinda right? was. It's like yeah it's examining assumptions and beliefs and yeah, yeah. And challenging that challenging processing it, through yeah. it you know so for our leaders doing the work is you know one of the greatest challenges that you have as a leader is that you have to lead the business, but you also have to lead a group of people. And it's very easy for many leaders to get focused very heavily on the business side of things and the, um, the work of the organization. So you lead a sales team and you're mm. focused very much on, um, Quota you know, and yeah. Targets, yeah, and you pay maybe less attention to how you're, leading the team what kind of culture the team has mm. even things like how am i running my meetings yeah am i am i running my meetings in a way that is effective to us having the right kind of conversations yeah. uh and, you yeah. know so I, when i say do the work that's kind of what i'm referring to is giving mm. people space yes to process their own assumptions and beliefs and mm. uh, maybe shift those if they're not serving mm. them mm. but also to do the work of you know, being a leader and thinking about the choices that I'm making, the kind of environment that mm. I'm creating, the kind of conversations I'm having, whether it's one to one or with the mm. team as a whole. And is that getting the results mm. that, that we want mm. and creating the kind of environment that we want? Yeah. Yeah. And the kind of environment where this kind of stuff is talked about as well. 
it strikes me that um, self awareness is a big part of this, right? Obviously, yeah. that's is where that's kind of what that comes from reflection. And um, did you see that come out like people being vulnerable and open about like realizations that they had about themselves? Are you asking if people were willing to share? Yeah, like it that? sounds like from the, yeah. the comments you were saying, like it was like these were like truly transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I don't know, like I don't know if you can even speak to the actual, obviously not the actual conversations there, or if you were part of that, but just what that um, interaction was like, you know, in terms of like people being vulnerable and open and really like I guess doing the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's something that we, I mean, that session, yes, but in general we try to create that kind of environment. I mean, even in, I host these hour long sessions once a month with our leaders called leadership learning labs. And that's also the kind of space that we try to craft. There is a place for people to come and know that they're just with, they're just with their peers. And that this mm -hmm. is a safe space for you to be vulnerable and share what you're struggling with and mm -hmm. share what's going on and, and and hopefully challenge each other a little bit to yeah. maybe think about something differently or to find a new way of thinking about it and yeah. you know that's a task of the facilitator for sure to you know make sure that you're setting that foundation and you know you can start by leading it yourselves but you know we spend a lot of time in you know breakout rooms and things like that where people can get into those smaller groups mm. but mm. yeah I mean, it's hard to be vulnerable in a group of 50 100 totally. people right but yeah. it's much easier when you're in a group of yeah. you know two or three yeah. five so. yeah even like even with breakout rooms and just like yeah. just getting that 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 group smaller um you mentioned getting leadership and executive buy-in and, and we, we will talk i think we should talk about how important that is and and but i think it's so hard <laughs> it's so hard right and i think the more interesting conversation is like how did you um have that conversation internally where people like almost like going back to that point as well of, of this isn't training so like what are we doing here right like how did you what, what did that process look like of socializing it at that executive level i didn't really that is a <laughs> great not the answer you thought you were gonna answer. get <laughs> yeah so yeah. you just you just did this yeah I, it was i mean it was within the scope of our team i would say what we did was a i we didn't really call it a pilot, but in a way it was. So, you know, it was it was a small enough, I mean, these were sessions that had 20, 25 people out of an organization of almost 5,000. Yeah. It's relatively small. Yeah. So, you know, we, you know, it's in budget, it's in scope, it's within, you know, mm. the remit of what we should be doing. And so, yeah, we just, Mm. We just did it, and then we get to share the results, which is way mm. more impactful. Mm. And so that's exactly what happened, right? Because you know, yeah. I could have tried to float it and make it this bigger thing and try and get more people into it, but it was, you know, I didn't. It could have gone another way. Yeah, it didn't. Yeah, but it was way more effective to then instead come back to my leader and just share with her. These are some of the comments that I came mean, out of this session. There's no better way. Yeah. yeah, and now she's like, well, can we? scale this can yeah. we do this with can we run it again yeah which is way way more effective right than totally. if i had said well i want to get you know 300 people in the organization through this and this is what yeah. it's going to cost and it's going to be this big you know big total number yeah. so yeah yeah wow okay so you're a little bit of a maverick of <laughs> i love that yeah um well and, and part of it's because i i you know i do find it really challenging to to build buy-in and to get and have those yeah. conversations and just to even get in the room, especially in a time when our leadership is so busy, right? Mm. Because they're dealing with all of this change mm. and, and processing through it. So one of the things that I'm really trying to work on is to connect what we're doing and what we could do very, very clearly and directly mm. to their greatest pain points and, and mm. what they're struggling with. Mm. And yeah, I think that will help. Yeah. Can you say what that is? Can you say like how it, it impacts the business? Because I think a lot of people listening, it, I mean, I selfishly also want to pr promote what you're doing because I think it's so important, this kind of work, right? Like, and I think part of that is showing people that it does have impact at the highest levels. Yeah. So we, what I would love to do that we're not doing yet mm. is to you know, in a perfect world, right, we could also look at, you know, retention numbers and see, because I see two outcomes of this. 
actually I see three outcomes just immediately from the comments that were shared. Mm. One is people who were disengaged and disconnected because they were uh, frustrated, disillusioned, in grief, mm. mm -hmm. coming back and being motivated and engaged again. Yep. So, you know, if we could isolate this group of people and, you know, compare their comments on the engagement survey, you know, that could show some impact. If we could show yeah. changes to their productivity, I imagine there will be, right? That would mm -hmm. be amazing to be yeah. able to measure that and show that. that. And then there's also probably some people that might leave mm -hmm. as a result of these yeah. sessions. Natural they might have, yeah. yeah. And that might be okay. Yeah. And that's so hard because retention is so important and is a top priority, yeah. Yeah. but retaining people who are not on board anymore and don't want to be there and feel yeah. like are in that, you know, victim mentality and maybe for a good reason, maybe there's yeah. not a, it's not the place that they want to be anymore. The yeah. direction that we're going is not one yeah. that they want to be a part of. And you know, that's, that can be okay for both mm. sides, mm. you know, it's in Definitely. their best interest. They will be so much happier. Yeah. Um, and so helping people to make that choice and, and mm. take that decision is also valuable. Yeah. 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 That's so, it is like the, the idea, it, it makes it less of a numbers game and more like about the individual. We're talking about real people here that, right. Like, yeah, that, that's such a, a lot. So you, you talk about engagement, productivity, the natural, the retention slash attrition part. Yeah. Like to me, I, I've thought about this a lot as well. Like those things build on each other, right? If you, you're engaging people in these conversations, they're now engaging with each other. They're engaged in the business. They're, that's only going to have benefits. But, but this is the hard part of our jobs, right? It's because actually trying to like often put a number, you often have to put a number on it, right? And that's You're that's expected difficult. to, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, can I, am I even allowed to? look at the, you know, we don't even really evaluate productivity, but let's say I took salespeople that were in this organization yeah. and compared their, am I even allowed to do that? Yeah. 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 But yeah. that's what they want. That's what the leadership yeah. wants, right? They want to have hard numbers behind it. And yeah. it's so hard because yeah. it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't always translate that way. Even if you were allowed to and could yeah. measure and find those numbers. Yeah. 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 It, it, but it's for us to get on hands on those kind of numbers is, is, great right like how fascinating is it to see even if the even if it's not like causation but yeah. there's correlation you see like hey this is you know this is working um let, let's go back to the the idea of scaling it so like you've had great success shout out to you and shabina um to, for, for that it's like now what how you talk me through how you're thinking about the scaling part of that so the very first conversation that we had about it is you know, do we put everyone through it and do we just make it like a mandatory thing that everyone does? And mm. the immediate reaction was you can't do that with mm. a session like this because mm. of the nature of it. You know, it's, it's highly reflective and it's deep and it's personal. Yeah. So, it, you know, and if you were to tell someone you have to go to this session and uh, then they yeah. go, it's not going to have, you're not going to have the you same kind of, yeah. right. That you're not yeah. going to have that same outcome. So what we've been talking about doing is a couple of things. And I, also have to give credit to my team because they're the ones who, you know, we just come up with the ideas. They're the ones who make it happen yeah, yeah. Um, and came up with the idea as well. So what we've been talking about is, you know, do we try and promote this through teams to run it at a team level mm -hmm. uh, and to have, you know, the same person come in and, and do it at a team level. We've also just talked about sharing you know sharing some of the outcomes running it again and then of course just the people who are in the sessions also promoting so we already have a, a wait list where they can say hey i went to this session i really think you would get a lot out of it mm. go ahead and sign up for the wait list and then we'll run it again so mm. um so that's kind of the first thing is just getting people through this same exact program mm. um, but we've also been talking about trying to see if maybe there's some more light lightweight version like a shorter version mm. that we could do that's maybe an hour an hour and a half something maybe even that we could do internally mm. um, so if people can't take the three hours and go that deep to at least still give them something and give them mm. an opportunity to again think and, and process and mm. have some time to move through whatever mm. they're dealing with yeah yeah I, I love that it's a fun problem to have now I had to figure out how to how to scale this yeah to have had that early success yeah I, 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 I didn't ask you this earlier, but the origination of that, I'm, I'm curious of how, um, if it was something that you learned in your master's, like what, 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 what do you think you saw in, in your past that made you 
think that this would be a good idea and, and i'm assuming you you then maybe started that conversation with shabina like talk me through that that it, like hey from like not thinking about it to this is a thing we want to maybe try well again i mentioned she was working with us before so she had done kind of similar work internally in the organization before okay. she, we had a program that she had created called playing with boundaries so i, I really I can't take credit for the idea and say that it was my idea. Um, you know, I would say where we identified the need and again, going back to buy-in for the organization and getting, you know, that alignment mm. is that I interviewed leaders across the organization and employees. So mm. part of our effort to figure out what we need to focus on and make sure that we're aligned, we did a lot of interviews and resilience in this concept of, you know, no, people don't need change management training. They need resilience. They need mm. skills to help them to move through this. Mm. And that just kept coming up over and over again. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's really where it came from. And from yeah. a, yeah. And you're connecting the dots then now, basically, between, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, finding the right partner for it, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, this idea of resilience, right? Like, uh, I, th I feel like it's an interesting topic as well because it, it's somewhat misunderstood it can be misunderstood because it's not resilience as like mental fortitude right mental toughness was i think kind of the original understanding of resilience but it's more than that right like how do you think of it yeah i think about this a lot too because are you you're familiar with anti-fragility yeah. yeah yeah so that comes up a lot when we talk about resilience too because people think of you know if you a resilient system or something that is resilient bounces back to mm -hmm. its original state. Mm -hmm. And that's the definition a lot of people, mm -hmm. I think, take. And that's where, mm -hmm. you know, anti-fragility came from is we have to move past just bouncing back and returning to a normal state. Mm -hmm. We should become systems and individuals and have, you know, again, the mental mm -hmm. fortitude or skill set or mm -hmm. attitudes, mindsets mm -hmm. to not just bounce back and return back to a normal state, but to instead... Uh, grow and expand. Mm. So one model that I really like that I bring into conversations about resilience is the concept of a window of tolerance. Yeah. That as we go through our lives, good and bad things happen, and we move into states of hyper arousal and hypo arousal, depending on the you know kind of chemicals that are released in our system. Mm. And all of us have our own unique window of tolerance mm -hmm. that is you know the normal ups and downs that we can handle without mm. getting dysregulated. Mm. And so resilience could be, you could look at it as just when you have a good or a bad thing happen that you just bounce back into that window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. But what's better than that, right? And this is similar to the anti-fragility concept is to actually expand your window of yeah. tolerance yeah. so that you can have more ups and downs and stay regulated as you yeah. move through that. Yeah. Yeah, and that, uh, the anti-fragility idea that the the whole system gets stronger, right, through through this process, so that there's a capacity increase. That's part of it, but it's also more than that, right? And I, I'm not quite even sure what it is, but it feels like there is a lot more than just capacity increase and returning to baseline, right? Right? There's actually like a leveling up, and like what a client of ours um, asked us to do training on continuous improvement mindset, right? And to me, that's a lot like the creative process of, you know, thinking like to me, it's a lot of like getting people to realize that they are creative. And mm. so once you start to see that, you see opportunities. And then if you can learn a process for it, even that um, it, it's sort of like we were talking about failing fast. right? It's like a part of that creativity yeah. as well. Like just knowing that you can do it and there's no like secret formula that no one's taught you. Like you just have to go and try things and, and see then the idea of continuous improvement mindset but then they also wanted that basically was like can you make that a change management initiative as well and there was like i felt a lot of confusion mm. from them around this like trying to shoehorn these two things together in a way i wonder if you have a perspective on that and because it does feel like it relates to this idea of resilience and, and improving capacity but also even you know improving the system yeah well, I'll link it to the, you brought up the fail fast. And I think yeah. that's a good example because that's something that our company is talking about. And so when you want to have a new way of working, whether it's, you know, people improving processes or being creative and innovating and having a fail fast mentality, mm. it's not, you can't, 
you can't just say, all right, let's start doing it this way. Like, this is the new way of working. We're going to do this. Here's the model. Now go and just operate under this new model, operate under this new way of working. Yeah. You have, and that's where I think the system piece comes into it is that you've you have to consider all of the things that are affecting people's behavior. Yep. And that's so much more than just a process or a model. Mm. You know, it's it's your reward systems. It's the way people talk to each other. It's the way that you run your meetings. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can implement a new, you could say we want to start, you know, failing fast. But in order to do that, there's so many more steps that you mm. have to take to define what that means for people mm. and to define I mean, even just the word failure holds so much connotation. Totally. So there's yeah. there's an unlearning and a, a relearning. There's defining boundaries and parameters of, okay, well, what kind of failure are we talking about? Yeah. And what's not acceptable yeah. because there is still failure that, you know, yeah. you don't want to see like illegal behavior, for exactly. example. Exactly. What not risks can we take and not take? Yeah. 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 And then how are people being rewarded and what kind of, um, you know, yes, what kind of processes do you have in place? But, you know, I think about... I think about meetings a lot because that's a time where you mm. could bring up mistakes and failures and yeah. the way that you respond to that and the language that you use around that mm. influences how people are going to behave in mm. the future and whether mm. or not they're going to take those risks and make those mistakes and try something new mm. and whether or not they learn from them because mm. that's the key to the fail fast. It's not about the failing, it's about the learning. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This idea of goals law comes up for me, which is that no complex system starts as a complex system. Like they all, no complex system in the world has evolved, from, has all evolved from simple systems. Vaguely, that's kind of the, the, the thing. And the, this idea of what you're talking about is, because my question is kind of like, how do you go and now get that? How do you change that behavior at a company, mm -hmm. at a system? How do you change the system, right? it's it seems like the only way to do that is like what you're doing with these with, with these um sessions that you're running is start small right mm -hmm. like you you have to and then just kind of grow from there like there's no silver bullet here to to change the whole system yeah so part of what we're trying to do and this is the bridge between learning and development and you know strategy work is we're trying to instead of okay we're rebuilding leadership development so instead of creating a training program where we give leaders specific skills that we think will be helpful. Mm. Yes, we do need to do that. Mm. But this is where they really need time to do the work. Mm -hmm. And doing the work in this case is figuring out what are the components of the system that need to change and giving them time to identify and find those reward systems or team norms or cultural behavior. Mm. Like what are we reinforcing in our organization, what kind of behavior, what kind of mindsets, how do we respond when people do X, Y, or Z, mm. and just giving them space to do that at the leadership level, and then taking the outcomes of that and translating that then into how we help the rest of the organization learn. Mm. So if they define we need to change our language around failure, so then we create resources for the organization to use and you know bring that down to every employee yeah um i again i can't say this on the other side of it saying we did it and it worked but yeah. you know that's one thing that we're talking about doing is yeah. is trying to just carve out the space and the time for people to do the work and then yeah bring it down throughout the rest of the organization yeah. and how how is the business responding to the carving out of time part of it? it's like how what what have those conversations been like what are the challenges with that yeah it's I would say we're not there yet, so I can't say for certain, but it's initially, at least, there's never a good response to asking people, especially busy leaders, to take yeah. time out, especially when you call it leadership development. Uh, and I'll bring it back to something you said earlier about self-awareness, mm. is that a lot of times they don't, people don't see the connection between their need and whatever it is that you're offering. Mm. So that's yeah. the piece that's going to be really important when we start to roll this out because everything we're talking about is so early, like this is all really, really fresh. Yeah. So, I mean, that's going to be the key is if, if we can connect it to pain points and, you know, yeah. the things that are keeping them up at night and help them see how it will benefit them, I think it will be easier. But if they just see it, if the communication and the message is, we need you to spend, you know, however many hours a month in, in leadership development or however many hours yeah. a quarter, then they're going to roll their eyes and be super yeah. frustrated. 
Yeah, I'm curious to get your thoughts on because the way we try and approach something like that is, and there's a there's a challenge that kind of stemmed that that resulted in us going this way was that companies were it's sort of looking at their emerging leader, high potential, whatever you want to call that um, cohort of people, and saying we can't promote every single person in here, and a lot of people mm -hmm. equates career progress with promotion. So what else can we do? And like a leadership development program, especially in a cohort, like is, is the, the thing we're trying with a couple of these clients to do that, to give people like feel like they're part of something, you know, and, and we do a lot of self-awareness work at the beginning, a lot of vision work. Like what are we trying to get out of this? Getting them to like really visualize their future yeah. and then share it with each other. And so they, they feel like, and actually genuinely experience progress in that, right? Where someone, if I'm, articulating a vision and, and you hear it for the first time you, you're like oh you should t talk to so-and-so are right? you making those connections for me that could be helpful um i guess a do you have a, a similar sort of challenge where you're you're looking for ways to going back to like engaging leaders mm -hmm. right because you can't always just pay them more or promote them mm -hmm. um and and then yeah let me just start there like is, is that a is that a com is that a challenge you you see as well engaging them beyond promotion and yeah. pay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so what are, what are ways what are things you're trying to do to solve that? I it's hard, it's hard because you know you think that putting them in a this is something that we I was just having a meeting about this last week we're launching a a women in technology program so we're going to sponsor five women in the organization and this is one of those things, right? Is how do we engage people? I mean, the hope is that they will eventually move into higher positions, mm. but that program has to be so good and so relevant for it to feel like a reward, right? Yeah. yeah. Cause even, you know, putting someone into a leadership development program and investing in them can, you know, if it's not reaping benefits for mm. them, if they're not getting something out of it, then mm. it's, just making their job more difficult yeah. because now they've got to continue to do the job and carve out the time for yep. the program. So, yeah. you know, I do think that is one way of, of engaging them and it's something that, yeah, that we talk about a lot, but I don't know that we have, I don't know that we figured out the answer yet. Yeah. I don't think, yeah. I don't know if we have either, but like if maybe we, to spitball, like what would, what would it look like if it did achieve that goal? You know what I mean? Like what would it look like to those female leaders Right to be like something that wow this was so worth it I'm so glad I did this yeah what's like the first thing that comes to mind well the first thing that comes to mind one of the things that we were talking about is giving them something to be proud of on the other side of it mm. so you know yeah that could just be completing a program mm. but we've talked about if whether or not there's some piece of work or a project something that they can have a real impact on mm. so one idea that we had was to just give them an opportunity this is the first time we're doing it so can we give them an opportunity to craft what the program looks like going forward Ooh, yeah, and so then that's idea. something that they can look back on and say i did that yeah you know it's yeah. that i mean it's one thing it's a thing they can put on their resume as well yeah. but it's also just that sense of achievement and accomplishment and yeah. and they should also learn and grow through that which yeah. I think is appealing so yeah, yeah that's what the first thing that comes to mind that is a great one it's like the capstone we're doing with one of our clients where they're working on they identify a problem in the business that impacts them and then in groups of three they are developing a best practice for that and our hope maybe by the end of this year is that one or two of those best practices actually become adopted by the company right how amazing would that be but yeah. at, at the very least it, it should help those three people um, but yeah, I love that idea of like working on something tangible that you can, it, it's like that create and creativity, right? Yeah. Like not just consuming, consuming, consuming in a learning context, but you're actually creating something. Yeah. yeah. And we talked a lot about whether or not it should be a business project or something like this. And the key, because I, I do think it's a great idea, right? To, as people are going through leadership development, they use the time to solve immediate problems, yeah. real problems. Yeah. And they'll learn through that process, that concept of action learning, mm. but they also can make an impact and so see the results and mm. the tangible results. But you've got to be able to implement it. Mm. 
or at least have leadership seriously consider implementing it. Yeah, and that, that was the piece that we're like, uh, yeah. we don't want to, you know, if you don't have that buy-in and you yeah. can't make sure that whatever the projects are that they're working on is something that will be deeply considered. Because the worst thing that you can do, right, is they present that capstone and they're like, okay, thank you, bye. Yeah, <laughs> you and know? it's like, why did we even do it's this? Like, oh, yeah. It's like, oh, so frustrating. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's very true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I get, yeah. I, do you have a would you say you have a strong relationship with your leadership like they they get what you're trying to do no okay okay working on it yeah yeah I, I mean I'm relatively new in in my role in the organization and then I have a new uh chain of command so my boss and my boss's boss both started within the last year and a half okay. so, so there's a lot um, of like forming yeah. and norming yeah so on. we're still in that stage yeah, so yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and that and that's um, yeah. I guess maybe a good segue in, into the last kind of question is to start to look ahead, right? And you, you've um, had early success here. You, you're you're also clearly like like I am a, a, a an avid learner. Like yeah. you're learning all the time, right? So every everything you're doing, you're learning from. You're taking that in. Um, how far ahead have you thought? Like what what is what are some of the things you'd like to see in place in say a year or two years time? So I'm really in a, in a very interesting and kind of, uh, I guess you could say exciting, but also challenging position where we're really just completely rebuilding almost everything, uh, the entire department, the entire function. I would love to see learning and development not be seen as a training mm. function in the organization, mm. um, which is a wonderful thing to have, right? It's great to have internal trainers and facilitators and people who a team can just call and, and have come in. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think the big goal with just the place that we are, where the company is, is that we can really be a strategic partner to the organization to mm. help people move through whatever it is that's going on. Yeah. Um, so enabling them not just with, you know, skills and knowledge and information, but time to, mm. you know, process and mm. uh, time to have conversations that are mm. important. So reflect. Yeah, so seeing the organization uh, really leveraging this function for, yeah, organizational effectiveness. Mm. So moving out of just training and, and learning and development and looking more at how the organization learns, mm. that would be that would be my big thing. And, mm. and for me personally, I want to see myself just be brave and courageous to, you know, speak up and say something if, mm. you know, if they're asking for something and I don't think it's going to work, mm. you know, just to be willing to to mm. say that and you know if people can make the decisions that mm. they want but mm. you know that's that's who i want to be as i lead through yeah this. i love that that, that was the, my question is the, the value that you wanted to yeah. embody and you know bravery and courage and and i love that answer but what are the challenges with that why is that so difficult for people to do in a work setting because i well i can tell you why i am why it's challenging for me and yeah. that's the only person i can speak for of course which is just a fear of the way that i'll be perceived yeah um, you know, a fear of not, yeah, just not looking good or, yeah. you know, and there is a, a real balance in that, that I don't want to be, I don't want to be seen as, and I don't want to be a, uh, I don't know. And I, I, the word that's coming to mind is naysayer mm. <laughs> and that's not at all what yeah. I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. It's just being willing to, you know, stand by what you think is right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you think there's a better way of doing something to be willing to, to state it and mm. make that known, but then, but yeah, I just, it's that fear of being misunderstood or yeah. Yeah. yeah not being seen the way you want to. And what, what do you think is going to get you through that? Of having a bigger purpose outside of, uh, outside of work and outside of my job. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. yeah that's a I mean, great that, that was something else that Matthew McConaughey talked about yeah. today, today too. Is he talked about just having something, you know, bigger than yourself, and for him and for me, that is faith and yeah. Uh, yeah. and God, right? Yeah. That like that is so much more important. That makes these little conversations yeah. and these little moments seem so small. Yeah. I think he also said, you know, we're all gonna die. You're gonna die someday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna die someday. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, why am I so worried about this? Yeah. Why am I so nervous to say? something that I believe yeah. in so yeah like letting go of the outcome yeah right yeah absolutely beautiful that's a great way to end the conversation and thanks so much for coming on the show and joining me here today thank you it was a pleasure
Hello, hello. I hope you enjoyed that episode. It's Andrew again with a quick message. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that is to leave us ratings and reviews where you listened. If you're on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe buttons and feel free to leave a comment. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please take the time to give us a rating and leave a review. Once again, we love hearing from our loyal listeners. If you're listening to this on Spotify, please hit the follow button to make sure that you don't miss new episodes as they come out. See you next week for another episode of the Learning Culture Podcast. Thank you for listening.